Hello and welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Today is the day one um, of the web talk series uh, where we explore the social impact of the pandemic together with our supporters uh, at the Devi Iha or the German Center for Research and Innovation, New Delhi, um, and other partners that we have in India and Germany. Um, my name is Adishri Jamkhetkar. I'm the program coordinator for the German Center for Research and Innovation here in New Delhi. And I welcome all of you here. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today evening. Um, a couple of um, technical instructions before we go ahead. Um, the participants or the audience who is here uh, will be able to um, participate in the web talk today through the medium of the chat window that you have here where you see everybody typing in. Uh, please use this uh, chat option to address to the speakers if you have or if you have any questions um, or any um, technical concerns. The team here will be able to help you with that. Um, unfortunately, we will not be able to have you um, together uh, to, to be able to participate with your voices or your video cameras. Um, so that is uh, only possible through this chat. Um, this chat, uh, uh, sorry, this web talk will also be recorded and be available for viewing later on. Um, so moving ahead, um, uh, we have today with us um, Mr. Gabher, who is the Deputy Ambassador um, to India from the German Embassy uh, here in New Delhi. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Gabher, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Mr. Gabher will have a short welcome address um, for us today, and from there on, we take it up with the panelists and the moderator. Um, so um, over to you, Mr. Gabher. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your introductory remarks. Uh, my name is Stefan Krapia. I'm the new deputy head of mission here in New Delhi. I just arrived a couple of weeks ago. And um, of course, I would have liked uh, uh, to participate in person in uh, these meetings because that's a better way to get to know each other. I see Mr. Wagner from Berlin. We also had the chance uh, to, to talk to each other, but we haven't met in person yet. But uh, we are still optimistic that um, uh, hopefully in the uh, next year we will meet in person and uh, can continue our exchange. But I would like to, uh, first of all, congratulate uh, the Deutsche Wissenschaftshaus, the uh, German Indian Science Center, uh, for all these events you have done already. I think uh, my colleagues told me on um, the health you had done a lecture recently. And now you are dedicating um, your uh, seminar for the next uh, three days uh, with very imminent uh, representatives from science in Germany and in India um, uh, to uh, the social impacts uh, of the pandemic. Um, and I think uh, this is uh, a very important role the uh, uh, Science Center can play here. Uh, I myself, I have been posted to New York and to Tokyo and uh, at these postings at these cities I could uh, experience uh, the great work uh, the science centers are doing in the, these countries and I'm very much looking forward uh, uh, to your work here uh, to see and I would like to support you very much in every uh, idea, in every uh, in every um, initiative you are taking because I think this is very important uh, for us and that's um, I'm uh, appreciating your work not only because uh, it's my personal experience but also because uh, last week uh, we approved uh, the German government uh, approved uh, new guidelines uh, new guidelines for Indo-Pacific because we want to concentrate more and to focus more on this region and of course there is a lot of um, talk about security issues, about economic cooperation, but uh, there is one chapter, a small chapter also dedicated to the science centers because they play an important uh, towering role in our cooperation and in our idea to concentrate more on Indo-Pacific and of course to concentrate even more on cooperation with India. So politically in our bilateral relations you also play a very important uh, role. That's what I would like to say to you and you can find uh, these political guidelines or at least a summary of it uh, on our webpage uh, and who is interested we can forward it to you. 
So when we talk about uh, the impact uh, of uh, COVID-19, I think it's very important to keep in mind uh, that the government uh, in India and in Germany and in Europe and in other countries as well, we had to take uh, very rigid measures to curb the pandemic. Uh, in Germany, we did this uh, also by advice uh, of uh, the scientific world. We were in close contact with our political decisions to have the scientific advice. And I think this is very important to have a close cooperation with science. But not only to find out what are the best measures to curb the pandemic, we have to cooperate very closely with uh, uh, the scientific world, the academic world. I think also in finding out what are the social impacts and the social consequences of the pandemic, we have to have close cooperation and close exchange with uh, academic world with you, as you are doing this uh, seminar in the next uh, three days. Um, our Chancellor, uh, in uh, many speeches or in several speeches, uh, she always uh, underlined that all the measures uh, being undertaken by the government in Germany, they are a democratic imposition, eine demokratische Zumutung. <laughs> I think uh, this is very important to keep in mind because uh, the government is already aware that this is a very special situation and it's not easy to take a decision, be it in India, be it in Germany, be it in Europe, to take a decision to say, well, um, if uh, you are traveling or if you have any symptoms, you have to go into quarantine. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gabriel. Thank you so much for your support and also, uh, you know, the, the insight into the matter from Germany and also from India in your position. Uh, where uh, we also hope that maybe next year we are able to meet in person and also have some of our events uh, together, even at the German Embassy, like before. So thank you so much for uh, for your welcome address. Now I will move on. Uh, to um, shortly talk about the panel that we have today. Um, so we are joined here with uh, our supporters from uh, from uh, across the world, let's say, from the University of Heidelberg, from uh, FU Berlin, from uh, University of Göttingen, and also their partners uh, in India, which is the uh, Savitabai Pune, uh, Pune University, and also our supporters, uh, Max Weber Stiftung. The entire web talk series has been conceptualized and organized uh, by the supporters of DVEHA New Delhi, a list of which you would find on the on the web page of our um, uh, of our organization. Uh, we are a network of um, 18 such German representations in India um, and work on uh, building up relationships between science communities and research and innovation between uh, scientists and organizations between India and Germany. And we are supported by Germany's Federal Foreign Office, um, wherein also the embassy um, where we work very closely with. So thank you so much to all the supporters who have helped with this. Um, now I would like to hand it over to Dr. Indra Sen Gupta, who is the moderator of uh, this talk today. Um, Dr. Sen Gupta is the head of the Max Weber Stiftung, um, India branch office in India, and is herself a historian of colonialism, German Orientalism, and heritage and hist historicities. Um, she has uh, taught for several years in India and Germany, and uh, also has researched at University um, of Heidelberg and in Tübingen. Um, so now, uh, Dr. Indra Gupta, over to you to introduce the panel and then take it over from there. Thank you so much to everybody. Uh, I will be in the background now, and so will be your team. So we are available on the chat for all your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adishri, and thank you to the organizers for putting together this really uh, much needed, very topical, and um, uh, and, and, a, and really a very rich uh, kind of a uh, web talk series with uh, some excellent speakers. Uh, I consider it a great honor and privilege to be asked to chair this session and to moderate it. Um, 
you, uh, there's something that Abhishek might have missed out, and that is while I'm the head of the India branch office of the Max Weber Stiftung, I'm also at the same time a research fellow at the German Historical Institute of the Max Weber Stiftung in London, which is where I am, and you may see that it's a slightly different time of day uh, for me than uh, in India, as it is for many of the speakers as well. Uh, I uh, would like to start by uh, referencing the uh, uh, Deputy Head of Mission, uh, Mr. Grabheber's, Grab, Grabheber's words, which were extremely, uh, I think, really went to the heart of today's discussion. Uh, and he talked about rigid measures put in governments uh, for a limited period of time uh, and which are potentially a restriction, a limitation on individual freedom and speech and uh, you know, civil rights. Uh, and that is basically what we, uh, what, is, what is the subject of today's web talk, which is on authoritarianism and democracy in times of the pandemic. Um, uh, I would just like to say um, just one or two words uh, by way of introduction to the topic. Uh, we know that pandemics are international crises, and we know that these are global movements. Uh, when the uh, uh, COVID uh, crisis broke out uh, in Wuhan, everyone thought that it isn't our problem. Within a couple of weeks, it was everyone's problem. And yet, and this is the peculiarity, um, that while we live in this intensely globalized world where anything that happens anywhere can potentially affect everyone everywhere, potentially, um, nevertheless, our response is always framed within nation states. In other words, the immediate response or the, or the, the, most, um, the most powerful, the most effective response uh, is framed within uh, the framework of the nation state, within national uh, discourses and within a national uh, framework of politics. And of course, there is an inherent tension in this. How do you contain a pandemic, both from a public health point of view, but also from the point of view of civil society and from the point of view of the kinds of questions that will be raised today uh, on a global scale? Can you do that? Is there an inherent tension between these kind of national responses and international pressures or international, re uh, international uh, responses? Is it possible at all to have some kind of an international political response that is effective under these circumstances? Um, we all know, and this is nothing new, that uh, the uh, pandemic has led to an immense concentration of power in the hands of the executive in a constitutional sense. Um, and this is true, uh, we know this is true of most countries. We think of India because that's the uh, context of today's discussion. But for example, in Hungary or in Brazil or you know wherever you look, uh, and uh, the US, of course, is a special case under these circumstances. So that is really the context in which we are having this discussion. Um, there are some questions that the concept note itself has thrown up, and I would like to uh, just sort of state these as the uh, agenda for the discussion, um, and then briefly move on to introducing the speakers. So are there certain yardsticks of measuring the proportionality of government restrictions on the rights of citizens under these exceptional circumstances? What are the long-term consequences of the pandemic on the relationship between state and civil society, government and citizens? Do different forms of rule contribute to the spread or do they contain the pandemic? And perhaps I might, I might add here, is it acceptable to compromise on civil liberties and on democracy for the sake of better public health management? And if yes, for how long? How long uh, for how long are citizens willing uh, to, to make these sacrifices and where and can there be a universal global response to these kinds of questions. Um, and then of course there are the societal uh, consequences. What about workers protections? Uh, what about migrant labour? And you have another session on uh, migrant labour tomorrow so that's not really the topic for the day. Uh, what about protections for ethnic minorities? Muslims in India, Dalits, and of course we know about, you know, we are familiar what, with the, the CNA, CAA um, discussions and debates that are going on in India today. 
What about the security of women and children uh, in a domestic context? What about gender violence, domestic violence? These are all these are things that fall within the purview of state and state policy, and the executive uh, is in a position to regulate these or not. And these are some of the consequences that we have been uh, dealing with. And finally, of course, the, the international checks. Uh, what is the international context? There is a need to find international solutions and hence working closely together is obvious. Is that the way forward? Or do we, or, or, or our pandemics also, do they also create a kind of climate where, for example, in the case of the India and China border dispute, where um, neighbors can take advantage of each other's weakness uh, to claim territory and to further destabilize politics uh, in the region and beyond. Um, and I think these are some of the questions that came to me as I was reading through uh, the, the CDs and the research work of our presenters today. And so it gives me immense pleasure to introduce uh, the speakers. And I have suggested uh, in my uh, correspondence so far that, uh, the, that we have the order of, disc uh, of presentation in the following order. We'll start with uh, Professor Rahul Mukherjee, and then go on to Shruti Tambe, then Lars Klein, and then Christian Wagner. So and that's the order in which I shall introduce you, and then hand, you, hand it over to the speakers to give a five-minute uh, opening statement each. And then I will throw you some, I'll throw some more questions at you, and we can thereby start off the discussion. Uh, and in the final third of our discussion, we will take questions from the audience, which they will type into the box, the chat box, and I shall read out to you, uh, and then you can take over. So I'll start with Professor Rahul Mukherjee, who is a professor and head, head of the Department of Political Science at the South Asia Institute of uh, Heidelberg University, which was my alma mater, I'm very happy to say. Uh, he has taught at a number of international universities, including the National University of Singapore, at its JNU in Delhi, at Hunter, Hunter College, the City University of New York, and the University of Vermont in the, uh, in the, in the US. He has written a number of books, as and many of us are familiar with his work. Uh, the most recent books uh, are Globalization and Deregulation, Ideas, Interests, and Institutional Change in India, uh, 2014. The Oxford India Short Introduction to the Political Economy of Reforms in India, also 2014. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Professor Mukherjee serves on a number of uh, uh, editorial boards of journals that uh, are internationally uh, known. Our second speaker is Professor Shruti uh, Tambe, who is the head of the Department of Sociology uh, and, at the, and the Center for Advanced Studies at the Savitri Bhai Pule Pune University in Pune. Uh, she is also a director of the Euroculture program, which is sponsored by the Erasmus Mundus at the Savitri Bhai Pule Pune University in Pune. Um, she is a very, very well-known sociologist and has worked on a number of, I mean, there's, there's a whole range of work that I'm sure you can look up on the, on the CV. Uh, but she, what is interesting, I think, is that she has been involved in a number of international collaborative research projects um, uh, with various countries. Uh, and at, at present, she's working on a research project funded by the ICSSR and, uh, and also an international research project on the health of waste pickers uh, with uh, Penn State University in the US. And I think, I, I expect that some of her talk will refer to this. Then we have Dr. Lars Klein from Euroculture, the, univers sorry, the University of Göttingen, if I'm not mistaken, or is that uh, into university, but perhaps you can come in on that yourself. Uh, he is a co course coordinator for Euroculture. He's a member of the examination committee. He is a cluster coordinator of, the social, of social sciences, economics, and law. Uh, and of course, a number of other uh, projects also related, also related to the Urban Lab project, uh, Migration Moves Göttingen. Um, and he uh, teaches a number of modules on, uh, these, uh, on these topics. Um, and our fourth speaker is Professor Christian Wagner, who is a senior fellow 
at the Stiftung Wissenschaft and, und Politik, uh, which in English very curiously translates as the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Uh, and of course, uh, Professor Wagner is a, uh, has a, a, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, policy research experience um, uh, on the region. And I'm very happy to know that this is what you will be talking about. And I think all the speakers' topics will sort of speak to each other, but there might be some overlaps, but not uh, many. Uh, and uh, Professor Wagner has been uh, a senior research fellow at the Center for Development Research at the University of Bonn. He was assistant professor at the Institute for Political Science and Administrative Studies at the University of Rostock. And before that, he was a research fellow at the Center for Modern Oriental Studies or or um, uh, in, in Berlin. Uh, and he's been in Mainz and in Freiburg. So I think what we can look forward to is a very rich set of presentations coming from very uh, related but different uh, disciplinary and practice backgrounds. So without okay, further you, ado, uh, I would Peter like to Heiden. hand over the microphone, because that's all we can hand over at the moment, uh, to Professor Rahul Mukherjee. Rahul. Is this better now? You are, yes. Uh, but if you could raise uh, the... So if you it's could indeed a great pleasure uh, to be with distinguished colleagues, some of whom I have known and I regard and respect. And also, uh, it's indeed heartening that uh, we had Dr. Sen Gupta from Heidelberg sharing this session. Uh, I happen to have a paper in the Journal of Democracy, uh, which is coming out in the October issue, which is somewhat critical of the way in which the government of India has handled the COVID crisis. And in that paper, I come to the conclusion that uh, perhaps uh, authoritarian propensities mm -hmm. have been reinforced in a manner that are detrimental to COVID management. So here we are not talking about the need for being authoritarian in order to discipline the population, but as uh, Deputy Chief of Mission, Mr. Grab here just pointed out, politics needs to match powering with what we call puzzling which means that political power needs to match very important and plausible technical ideas. In this respect, I believe that uh, some of the measures that the government of India took were very, very hasty. So, for example, the manner in which the parliament was brought to an end during the budget session with absolutely no consultation with either federal level units in the states or with opposition parliamentarians was something quite unusual in the history of India. And this could have benefited because Kerala had already a very good experience with COVID management. However, that was not to be. Apart from a lockdown that was sudden on the 24th of March with four hours of notice, we also find that technical experts were not consulted. So if you had consulted the epidemiologist, there were two papers in the Indian Journal of Medical Research, which pointed to the fact that a curfew type lockdown will not work. Another paper in the Indian Journal of Medical Research had actually projected the kinds of growth in infection that we are seeing. One of the papers had even suggested that if you tried this kind of lockdown, it would only work for relatively lit rich people who live in you know, less dense spaces. Now, this, these papers are actually authored by people from the Indian Council of Medical Research, which is a body of the government of India. Even with respect to testing, there are departments of the government that work more closely with the states. Those departments of the government were ignored. Almost all economists had suggested that the first thing to do in a crisis like this is precisely what Germany has done. This is the best reason to put money in the hands of people. 
And when I say that Germany has done it, it is very significant because Germany has never been a Keynesian country. It's never been a country that believes in not matching its budget. But whether it is Germany or whether it is Singapore, technical advice pointed in the same direction. In India, however, and since the time is short, I won't belabor the point, uh, there's been a real shortage of the manner in which more money could easily be infused to a larger number of people, given the technological facilities that were available. Now that all of this had happened, India has a vibrant civil society. So there were public interest litigations by activists such as Harsh Mandar, Aruna Roy and Nikhil Day, upheld by India's leading public interest lawyer, Mr. Prashant Bhushan, whom I happened to interview a few days ago. And if you look at all of these public interest litigations, they were precisely pointing in the direction that would have benefited the government. One of them said, go for more technical advice. The second said, improve the conditions of migrant labor. And the Supreme Court decided not to take notice. It did take notice towards the end of May, by which time it was too late, by which time a lot of migrant labor had hopped, stepped, jumped, defied the law, and tried to get back. So the result of all this was that a lot of migrant labor which got infected in the metropolises went back to their rural settings with COVID infections. So in my paper, I actually cite that as of early July, 80% of the new infections in the state of Jharkhand came from migrant labor. So uh, basically then we find that uh, what uh, the Deputy Chief of Mission said, that technical advice was ignored but the most important thing, and how many minutes do I have? Uh, how many minutes would you give me? So I will end here. The most important thing that I would end with. You, uh, is well, that you're actually past your time for another couple of minutes, perhaps. And I would welcome okay. more questions here. Health is a state subject within the Indian Constitution. The fight for COVID management is at the level of the states. The government has made insignificant transfers for enabling states to deal with this crisis at the very time when even the regular funds that the states should have received as a result of the goods and services tax collection have not reached the states. So we are faced with a very, very severe problem. The states have to fight COVID. They have no money. Many of their civil servants can't be paid. The economy has contracted by 24%. Unemployment has risen. Prices have gone up. And I think this is really a time when India needs more consultation, both within politics as well as with technical experts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rahul, and I'm very sorry to have to cut you short, but we can come back to these points in the discussion. Uh, since Shruti Tambe is having some difficulty joining us, I suggest we move on to, to you, Lars Klein, if I may, uh, for your presentation, which uh, takes us uh, perhaps slightly away from uh, Rahul's topic uh, in ways that you can elaborate. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Indra, just... Oh, sorry, just bear with me one moment. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, so, Professor Tambe might be able to participate by audio, so you ah. might want to check that. Okay, all right. Uh, in which case, shall shall we try that first then, Adishi? Or shall we move on to... Your choice. It's just that she might, she's not visible okay. with her video camera, but she's participating by okay. audio. Okay. Uh, in that case, Shruti, can you hear us? Because we can't hear you. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Thank you. I, I do so, but um, indeed, yeah. it's taking us a bit in a different direction. Um, so thank you, first of all, for having me. It's a pleasure. Sure. Then move, move um, on, please. I want okay. To, I'm sorry. Last time. Perhaps you can continue um, then. Briefly. Yeah. Um, and that adds to your introduction, Indra. So in April 2020, according to Open Democracy, two billion people. Uh, lived in countries in which parliaments were restricted, in which 
world of courts was reduced, the elections were postponed. Um, so it was indeed uh, said to be the hour of the executive. Um, the Carnegie Endowment has concluded an article in March already, and that was referenced by Ivan Kostev in his book, has concluded in March that in the face of COVID-19, uh, those countries managed to react most effectively, which firstly had experience in dealing with crisis, secondly, were most effective in terms of running a country, and thirdly, in which societies had the higher level of trust in their government. Uh, and that, as we learned, was not a question of political system, because um, those countries performing well. Uh, then were China and Germany, for example, so very different systems. If we zoom into Germany, um, the authority now is handed over uh, authority to better uh, COVID is handed over by the federal parliament to the executives of the federal level and the lender. Um, there seems to be agreement uh, on the measures taken to be rather yeah. successful, as successful as they can be, although every day we hear about demonstrations against the measures taken. The trust in the government has risen from 60 to 80 percent, uh, which is quite quite a remarkable increase, I think. Um, I'm, I'm not addressing now the effects of, of the COVID crisis. Mannheim Penner has recently felt, found that um, it affects those people with a lower level of education twice as much as those with a higher. So, of course, there's an imbalance and it's the um, duty of the government to level that out, and we've already heard that a lot of money has been, been used in order to do so. With regard to the measures uh, from the judicial point of view, the former president of the federal um, con constitutional court, Papier, has held that as long as nobody knows um, which measures are effective and which are not, and, and how to evaluate of it, it's very hard to say um, well, what's adequate, what's not, what is allowed, what is not. Uh, he's just adding that the continuation of measures needs to be substantiated, always not the relaxing. And we've already heard from Mr. Garpia that, of course, they have to be limited in time, and that's the difference to Hungary, for example, where the state of emergency that was declared in the first instance was done so for an unlimited time. Uh, zooming out a little bit, um, now if we're talking about Hungary already, I'm talking about Hungary already, um, I would be rather optimistic, I offered the op optimistic perspective here. I, my impression was that the nationalistic reflex, as I want to call it, was corrected, and unlike so in the summer of migration of 2015, for example, um, we've also seen here that borders were sealed. Um, we've seen that masks were stashed rather than shared with Italy, for example. Uh, um, so that the national reflex was uh, re was corrected. Um, masks were then shared with Italy. Italy hospitals were opened, and if we look at the European Union, we have for the first time. Um, money taken up by the European Union centrally, something that many people opted for, uh, at least since the financial crisis um. of 2008. So we have many, uh, 2008, many things underway now that previously were not um, to be imagined. So um, many commentators say now that rollback is not possible, the virus will shutter the very foundations of our lives, so where Shizek writes, although he says we're not sure whether we're any wiser now or not. Um, the breaks are put, the rest is upon us, the philosopher Di Cesare writes. And I would tend to agree. Um, we see how much can be done, how much change is done relatively easily, how much money is available. So I agree with those. So. Whenever bigger changes have been discussed, it's been said, no, we don't have uh, the money, we have to think of the economy, we have to think of the job market. Um, it's a question of authority, of creativity, you name it. And now these claims are very hard to, to counter in this stance. And I think that's 
um, that's Thank a good sign um, for us. It's a, but it's a bad sign for autocrats, maybe as well. That's all right. Thank you very much. That ended on a very optimistic note. You did you did promise us a little bit of optimism, and I'll take you up on this in the discussion. Uh, is should the uh, back uh, or should we continue with uh, Christian Wagner and then come back to no, to India afterwards? On and then I, I will connect with him one more time. Yeah. Okay. Can right. you hear yes. me? Okay. Uh, this uh, maybe it's not a bad idea. Yes. We move okay. away from Thank India. Um, uh, we've moved all, to thank Europe. Thank you very much. Or, good afternoon. Or general from Berlin. conversations. Good we now Delhi. move to uh, the Christian Wagner. We'll talk about the regional dimensions, and then we'll come back to India again. Um, so, Christian Wagner, over to you. To be part of um, this webinar. Um, let okay. me pick up some of the points that Rahul has already mentioned, because and this would be a sort of a counter picture to the optimistic note of Lars, yes. uh, which he gave. Uh, I yes. would rather yes. probably make a not so optimistic picture when we look at developments in the region. Let me start with a more general um, uh, point. Uh, there has always been a debate about, let's say, natural disasters, if we name the pandemic as a natural disaster or a black swan event or gray swan and political developments. Uh, and there's always been a debate, especially in our part of the world in South Asia, in how far it has an effect on domestic and uh, regional crises. What we've seen in the past is that these kind of events do not have a, a let's say, a game-changing effect on already existing political trends and crises. I give you two examples. Remember the tsunami in Sri Lanka in 2004, which also um, um, came into a period where the negotiations between the Sri Lankan government at that time and the uh, LTTE um, uh, had already um, become um, more uh, worrying. So, the, so there was a big dispute then about the um, relief assistance. So the tsunami, and there was some hope in how far the tsunami could somehow change the overall setting, but it did not happen. Mm. So uh, the tsunami acted more like a fire accelerant to further uh, worsening um, um, the negotiations. The second, on the positive aspect, was you remember, you may remember the earthquake in Kashmir in 2005, which gave a push to the rapprochement between India and Pakistan. And the reason was that both countries had started and their composite dialogue already in 2004. So uh, again, the, this natural disaster, this black swan event somehow just um, uh, strengthened uh, already existing processes. So when you're following um, now come, coming to the pandemic, I think it's interesting and those of us who work on the region, we are, we are observing since a couple of years that we see authoritarian tendencies uh, in most in most South Asian countries, uh, fostered by different um, 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 developments. So it seems to me when you look at the kind of countermeasures that are put in place by governments, um, it seems to follow the old rule, never miss a crisis. Mm -hmm. So of course gov governments have to um, have to uh, put a lot of orders in for public health, but you also get the idea that in some cases uh, it's also directed directly or, or indirectly against, um, against uh, political um, opposition. I think the governments have used, let's say, these new op opportunities to further strengthening their authoritarian tendencies, at least in three different, er uh, three different areas. First is what we would call control of information. Of course, there has been, uh, this is also not a new development in, in, uh, in the region. And of course, you can argue from the point of public good, and we have the same debate in Europe, it's necessary for some form of control of information for the simple reason to, uh, to avoid the spreading of fake news and rumors. Okay, this is a point which, yes, there's, this is always a, a, a a uh, very critical choice governments uh, have to take. And of course, we have seen, and this is why I would not be so optimistic, um, that also gov governments in the subcontinent use this kind of control of information 
to avoid rep uh, reporting about gov uh, about government failures. Uh, Rahul has mentioned some of them. Uh, when you follow the developments in the region, you find a lot of you find a lot more. And of course, you could also use this against dissenting voices, opposition voices. So, but this is a, a tendency which has already been there. It's just strengthening. Second point, uh, what we have also observed is strengthening prejudices against minorities, especially Muslims. We have seen this debate in India when about the Tablagi Jamaat con uh, congregation, which then turned out, unfortunately, also to be one of the sources uh, for uh, spreading the virus. Um, you have seen similar reports on in uh, Nepal uh, against Muslims and um, being the being the super spreaders, so so to say. And of course, we have seen the prejudice against again Muslim minority in uh, in Sri Lanka. There, it was also related to the Easter Sunday uh, attack last year, and we have seen a lot of clashes uh, in Sri Lanka before that be uh, between um, radical. Buddhist groups and the Muslim minority. So let's say this kind of reporting or um, the pandemic has somehow intensified again already existing prejudices against uh, minority groups. The third factor, the third segment is very closely linked to what uh, Rahul has mentioned. Um, the pandemic will is also used to somehow change or alter the balance, um, the balance of the separation of power in favor of the executive. And you've seen this on very different levels. In India, Rahul has mentioned one of the biggest challenge or in the long term also would be um, or is the relationship between the center and the states. What kind of federalism should be there? What about the money? Rahul has rightly mentioned it's the states uh, who have to, um, to fight, um, to, um, to fight uh, uh, against the pandemic. So in, so in how far can you really uh, bring back a proper balance? We have seen similar developments um, when uh, institutions of oversight and control have been um, somehow um, been not properly acknowledged in, Bang in Bangladesh, for, for instance. The, um, the budget was, um, was confirmed without the proper consent of the parliament. In Nepal, we've seen the suspension of the parliament in Pakistan. Um, an article um, was uh, imposed which allowed um, to deploy the army in the provinces, which means that the, the moment this happens, it's Article 2, 245, um, then high courts would lose their uh, jurisdiction in these areas. So we have seen a lot of these very subtle moves by the executive, which of course are necessary because we face lack of state capacities in the fight against uh, pandemics. And this is where I think I would be more negative com compared to last, because we are operating in a state system where we have relatively weak state capacities, which makes it uh, a much bigger uh, drama um, in the long term. So come, let, let me come to my, to, to, my, uh, to my conclusion. As I said, pandemic is not a political game changer. It's more a fire accelerant. It will, it will, strengthen the existing negative authorian tendencies. It could have also been, let's say, positive if we have seen more regional cooperation between India and Pakistan. I'm not touching here on the regional di dimension. We can do this in the, in the Q&A. I think what is also an interesting uh, point for discussion in how far the government failures we can observe, do they lead to more opposition? I would be critical for the simple reasons that you have deficits in public health systems in all countries, which are structural. So they are independent from all the ruling parties. I mentioned in the German press that India would find an extremely difficult time because you are not able to somehow have to somehow uh, uh, compensate the missing um, um, in investment in the public health system in six weeks to find a pandemic, what you did not do for 70 years. So in that sense, I think um, one should be clear and also keep in mind that unfortunately we have very yeah, limited state and governance uh, capacities in South Asia, which I would say will make it more a negative outcome in the long term. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian Wagner. I uh, is uh, shall we try? So we have to wait for our fourth speaker now. And Shruti, hopefully you are able to join us now. Can I would just hear make us? a few remarks before the connection gets lost. I thank the organizers and I thank all my co-panelists. And here are some of the observations that I would like to Well, that's a great shame because I think we would all have been very interested to, to hear more from Shruti, as I imagine she would have talked about the societal implications uh, of, um, of this crisis uh, and perhaps in relation to her work on uh, Health uh, on uh, migrants' health, um, but that's speculation on my part. Maybe if we can get get her back in later, then uh, we'll see how we go. Now, we start a, bit, a brief panel discussion. I think these are very good opening statements. And just to kickstart the discussion, I uh, I mean I have a whole list of questions, but I will just limit myself to to one cluster, or maybe two clusters. First is: Are there spaces of resistance in any of any form in this? in what you have described as authority of uh, you know authoritarian executive structures or executive control uh, and uh, i mean this brings me back to to Lars's point about the you know about optimism and where we can um, where we can see uh, ways in which the executive also becomes weaker my question is uh, that this kind of opposition or resistance can come from of course the usual corner civil society and so on but there are also uh, you know the negative aspects of resistance such as for example the anti mask movement or you know the anti vax movement and so on so or or religious groups or other cultural groups that uh, resist this kind of state action but from a very different perspective not from a democratic perspective uh, and um and I wanted to talk about uh, my second question really relates to um, perception, public perception and perception in the media. So, for instance, um, how does the press engage with this? And, and we know what restrictions to the freedom of press um, exist, uh, but also the role of social media. This sort of ties us in, in a way, to civil society and kind of resistance uh, from a point of view that may be good, but not necessarily so. Uh, and this brings us, of course, into the domain of fake news, which is a way of encountering uh, these debates, which is also a way of uh, asserting, if you like, civil rights, but not in the way in which we understand, not in, from a democratic uh, I perspective. I wonder how the panel well uh, you know, engages with these kinds of questions at all. Uh, so should we have uh, perhaps uh, a response in the order were, uh, of India the presentations? Should no, we start with you, Rahul? Uh, and if you don't mind uh, unmuting yourself, I think you're muted. Sumomoto notice is something that the Supreme Court gives out of its own volition. To a certain number of tweets that Mr. Bhushan had positioned uh, regarding the decline of the Supreme Court. Uh, I have an extended 50-minute interview. And what is coming out of this is that Mr. Bhushan was asked to pay a fine of rupees one. Mm -hmm. He was prepared for more. Uh, the one rupee fine is being viewed as a victory because he has not been sent to prison. Uh, now, while the court was adjudicating, mm -hmm. the manner in which Justice Mishra was dealing with these issues uh, was rather uh, reprehensible mm -hmm. and the Attorney General actually counseled the Justice of the Supreme Court to pardon Mr. Bhushan uh, because what Mr. Bhushan had tweeted he thought could at best get a reprimand but not a punishment. This was the government's Attorney General counseling the Chief, uh, the Justice of the Supreme Court. The Justice of the Supreme Court also happened to be somebody who had been systematically against Mr. Bhushan who is India's leading civil rights lawyer. Uh, in his reply to the Suomoto notice, Mr. Bhushan has said that the views that I hold are also held by sitting and retired justices of the Supreme Court. And that a judge who has systematically gone after me should not be sitting in a judgment over me. So this is, this is the legal context 
there is a tremendous amount of fight that is taking place in the legal arena. I found that through to the counsel of the government to the, uh, uh, to the media, especially the television media, there was far less coverage of this event in the, in the regular television media than there was on Facebook and on internet media. Uh, held by people like Akash Banerjee and uh, Dhruv Rati and others. So what does this tell us? This tells us that there is certainly resistance. Um, uh, there is certainly resistance. You know, Ravish Kumar did an interview of Mr. Prashant Bhushan. But what this also tells us that is that the uh, television media is not uh, as it would like to be. Uh, Finally, I think what is most distressing is that while there are civil society movements, like many of you would have heard about Shaheen Bagh before uh, COVID came along, uh, women were protesting outside in a place uh, close to the Jamia Millia Islamia University saying that the Citizenship Amendment Act goes against the secular character of the Indian Constitution and we are Indians as Muslims. Now certainly there was a lot of public outcry. It's amazing how people were sitting with the Indian constitution, upholding it, uh, largely Muslims but also some Hindus in support. However, what is really distressing, and this is where, you know, this is I think something we democratic theory and practices to take more carefully cognizance of, is that opposition politics is unable to rally behind uh, the civil society activism that exists on the ground. So Mr. Bhushan is telling younger people that, you know, you have to spend a little time in jail. Please go to jail. Fill up the jails with more people and then the government will take notice. He's saying that I'm happy to go to jail because I am trying to uphold the constitution. I am trying to, I am not trying to beat the constitution. I'm trying to, and that, that sort of connects with what Christian said. Uh, and I think what he said is very, very important. I think it is the most succinct statement that I've heard from anybody. That if you have an exogenous shock, don't expect an exogenous shock to transform you in a positive direction. It will, whether the directionality is positive or negative, it will just intensify that directionality. So India was headed towards a new idea of India. And this is, of course, for Indians to decide what is the idea of India that they will live with. And certainly, uh, uh, the tragedy uh, yeah. that India faces today is that there is civil society resistance. You're looking at a culture that is thousands of years old, which has got all kinds of philosophies that contradict each other, where, you know, Islam and Hinduism has produced even synthetic uh, scenarios where, you know, Kabir Das, you cannot say whether he was Muslim or Hindu. If this is a very different kind of a culture that has been born over centuries and uh, the, 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 the social capital and the intellectual capital of that culture, if harnessed properly, uh, can be a beacon light to the world, but tragically, India seems to be moving in the opposite direction. Okay, thank you. Yes, well, uh, I think you've taken the debate quite interestingly from uh, to a, you know really a very wide definition of resistance, which I also think is a way of I mean, there are, you know, how is it that there that despite all this, there is still so much support for authoritarian practices? You know, this is okay. the kind of democratic authoritarianism yeah. that we okay. are talking about. I think uh, you've mentioned this in one of your much, uh, 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 papers. For your answers, Perhaps, uh, because Magna, I, I think they like show some of the challenges I think what you have to say really that the country is facing. When you move going back to the to question of Indra question. about resistance, well, I think one should differentiate what forms of resistance. Yeah. Of course, you have seen small battles between migrant workers and policemen yes. which try to hinder them yes. to, to, yes, to go back to their villages. Do we mean this as resistance or do we look at the kind of resistance what Rahul mentioned about civil society against the restrictions? I, I think the challenge in most South Asian countries is that uh, we see very different forms and m many people would probably pref uh, prefer not to resist because they would be more happy to benefit from a 
from a better public uh, public health system. Um, so they would look for more government and they would probably not care so much. And this has always been the, di the dilemma in this whole debate, especially on the migrant workers. <clears throat> do people have the opportunity to go to work or do they have the opportunity to starve? At the end, it boils down to this dilemma. This is why the lockdown, of course, would not have been, couldn't have been yeah. successful. So this is, and this is an area where nobody wants to be a decision maker because there are no good choices in in this moment. So I think when we look at uh, forms of resistance from the civil society perspective, I think this is a very small number, very li limited number. It's not giving the kind of press restriction. I wonder in how far we can really follow the, the true story because I think we've seen a lot of restrictions which may also go up to this point um yeah so i i think we may not see a lot of restrictions more against the uh, police force trying to hinder the migrant workers go back to villages and um get these things um I, I was also astonished i wonder you you raised the point indra and it made me think because in germany and many parts of europe uh, we have seen in these in these demonstrations against government restrictions, the anti vaccine movement. I wonder whether you, there is a similar movement in India. I've never heard of it, and I assume most people would be happy to get a vaccine rather than think about possible uh, ne <clears throat> negative consequences. On the perceptions in the press, as I said, it's extremely difficult. Um, at the end, the freedom of speech has to be decided by court ru rulings. Um, I'm not sure and I'm not following it very, very closely. There have always been attempts also to limit the range of, uh, of social media. But as I mentioned, uh, as far as I have followed it, it seems also that social media again has also been an area where many times prejudice against minorities or other groups have been fostered. So has yeah, strengthen the negative tendencies, so to say. Thank yeah, well, in, in, just to start with, I mean, if we assume that uh, authoritarian leaders mm -hmm. don't like crisis thank that they've you. not thank created you. themselves. Uh, Lars, because if you can respond to the question on resistance if you like, or if you can also speak more generally if you prefer, against uh, uh, on uh, the um, other point that I raised about media. People who get criticize a uh, regime uh, are going up, and, and Human Rights Watch report to that, and that fits to what we've heard from Christian in particular. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of, of different case um, when I turn to, to Germany, but I'm, I'm taking the optimistic stance now also for the sake of the uh, discussion. I think from the left point of view, what's important here is that um, there's been such a, a stark position taken by the government here. Um, and that's, of course, encouraging uh, for anybody who would like state intervention and state intervention for a certain and cause and, 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 and using money for certain measures and so on. So I think that explains why from the left there's a lot of applause. Uh, now. But um, of course, we have a discussion about um, the role of the parliaments also in Germany and in particular in Europe. Of course, the context in which now Europe is strengthening again is um, a debate of whether Europe would fall apart, and that was only in March that this was uh, a serious concern and one of the possibilities, mm. I would even say. So, uh, it's just to contextualize my work a little bit and relate to uh, what the colleagues have said on the panel. With regard to the uh, reactions, I agree with, with Christian, this is probably a minority, it's also a strange mix of people we can see in Germany. Um, and I have the feeling, but that's only my impression, that they, they are getting a lot of coverage and maybe more than they needed to get. Um, COVID is not a game changer, but it's strengthening a lot of effects. And one is that Populism is decreasing in Germany, and that shows the latest um, populismus barometer. So it's going down um, by 
11% in the last year. So the people who, who call themselves populists are 20% of those who call themselves unpopulist, uh, or can be have to be regarded unpopulist, uh, 47% going up by 15%. So, so I think there's a, a tendency uh, that's strengthened um, mm. by COVID, and I would still say in a more positive sense. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, because information is needed, solid information is needed, the role of expert is strengthened mm -hmm. in a constructive way, not in the sense of expert governments that, that we could also see as a... Mm -hmm. So uh, I think there's a lot of reshuffling mm -hmm. going on. Um, thank you. Yes, carry on. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to add? Oh. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have a number of questions from the audience. Well, two so far, but we are uh, we can collect more. Uh, perhaps before I uh, before I take or pick up the audience questions, are there any questions that you would like to pose to each other amongst the panelists? Uh, this is this would be another opportunity to uh, to continue the debate. Um, uh, but if you don't, then we can move on to the audience questions. Um, I don't see any response, so I think we'll move on to the audience questions, perhaps, and then see if uh, there are further questions. So there's a question. Um, uh, I'm sure this que it says it's addressed to me, but I'm sure it's not addressed to me. I will read it out, uh, and the panel can take it up. Do you think that the government of India is doing enough keeping in mind the massive population the country has and unlocking so early, uh, like public transport, gym, etc. Is this a good decision? So unlocking, is that a good decision? I mean, I, I think this raises the bigger issue of the whole timing business. I think Rahul started with that. You know, did we, was it the right measure? Was the lockdown uh, right at the right think, time? Uh, and and if it wasn't, the then was the, is the unlockdown uh, a lot of uh, equally wrong? And is it the wrong time? So would you, would somebody uh, like to uh, uh, take uh, that up? And then I'll come to the move on to the second me. question. Disagree with me. <laughs> and you have to look, unmute yourself. Uh, India, uh, after all, has a very powerful leader. He has been able to lock down. And I was saying that, and, and it's not just me. There were experts uh, in the in the in the in the in the medical task force that the ICMR had set up which was not consulted by the Prime Minister, who were suggesting, even some people who were very sympathetic to the Prime Minister's view, were part of his team, in their independent moments, they were saying that the lockdown actually has to become a preparation for opening up, right? So, so a lockdown has to be a preparation for opening up. Now, if a lockdown has to be a preparation for opening up, then you have to have, you know, what Christian and others said, a lot of discussion on what the nature of the lockdown should be. At the South Asia Institute, in the worst of scenarios, at least one professor was coming to his office. It was not a curfew. And anybody, any meter could come, if required, for specific purposes. Uh, we were able to do our classes online. Heidelberg is a very conservative university. It doesn't have a, an engineering school. But we devised something called ICON, and the rector said we will go online, and we went online. Of course, we didn't go. Love going online. We would love to go offline as soon as we can. But, <coughs> but the fact of the matter is that when you close down, when you shut down, and when you open up, you have to take those. Uh, you have to take those calls. So I was able to service my car. I was able to get. Uh, a bed in my garden done, uh, a whole lot of things could be done. Of course, you have to wear masks, you have to maintain your social distance, and you can't go out and eat in the restaurants. And slowly and surely, from when the figure came down from 6,000 to less than 500, Germany said, let's open up. Now, it's not like Germany did everything right. Uh, Germany, I think, also underestimated Corona and let it go, let it grow. But when it happened, you know, Angela Merkel got the smartest people in town across disciplines, medicine, psychology, and used the federal structure to decide how this will happen. So you can have a dialogue about the fact that rights were not respected, but the extent of consultation, the extent, the extent of, um, of 
respect for the federal level was enormous. In the Indian case, and I can say, uh, you know, say this with some authority, not a single chief minister of a state was consulted, not one, in the opposition. People like Rahul Gandhi and Sitaram Yachuri were asking for a parliamentary discussion. And it was not allowed. In fact, I have cited the kinds of discussions that took place. None of it has anything to do with a lockdown. So you, when you do a lockdown like that, all that you can get is euphonic because you don't talk to the economists, you don't talk to the epidemiologists, you don't talk to the people. And that has resulted in this crisis. And therefore, India is in this predicament where the economic effect of the lo lockdown has been so devastating that, you know, it, it, despite 90,000 cases a day, which according to some estimates could be 200,000, it can't just afford it. So, in fact, my view is that the government has to wake up. It, of course, has to calibrate. I mean, they can't keep the economy shut down forever. But it is an even greater crisis when you must bring together your opposition parties, your federal level, and your experts, and say that we are in this game together. So what is the, what is the state saying today? Go borrow from uh, private sources, and we will not even pay your GST dues. And a lot of opposition politicians and economists are saying that it is the central government that must borrow because it's easier for the central government to borrow and pay the GST dues to the states and give them some extra for COVID relief. Because you can't expect a poor state like Jharkhand to be as credit worthy as let's say the central government of India. Economists are also saying that this is the time, it is never too late to put more money in the hands of people. Please don't get worried about the fact that they will not spend. Because unless you raise the demand in the economy, who is going to be using whatever the economy is going to produce? Mm. So I think this is the situation where, of course, we should forget about what has happened in the past. We must look into the future. And in the future, I don't see that India can afford even a partial lockdown of the kind that many countries had. However, it must, it will have to lock down certain hotspots. It will have to work with very high level of technical advice and it will have to go away from the centralization model that we are beginning to see. Uh, uh, that, that is actually getting reinforced as a result of uh, COVID. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come in? I, I think, Rahul, you raise a very uh, interesting point that has been at the back of my mind for a very long time, which is whether, uh, you know, countries which have a, an essentially uh, confrontational combative political culture uh, uh, where uh, you know you have the first past the post system that there is a tendency uh, for authority that, that authoritarian tendencies could become stronger and there could be less consensus building than in countries like Germany where, for example, you have the proportional representation system, which means that governments are, uh, by definition, have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, emerge on the basis of a consensus. And that, that model, uh, yes. you know, works better I mean, uh, in times of something that is only uh, now in, crises I mean, like this. Uh, Mr. Prashant um, mentioned this in the interview that I, I did I don't know whether him. you... And uh, this is not uh, being uh, heavily debated at this point in time, but I do think it deserves serious debate about the merits of a PR system. But you must not ignore mm -hmm. the fact that if, uh, if Jawaharlal Nehru had wanted, India would never have had a democracy. I mean, in, there was no other government in power from 1947 to 1967 in the central parliament or in any other state in India, I mean, let's say from 1952. So you've got two decades of complete dominance, first past the post, and then you begin to lose the states. That means what? There's something respectable about this practice. Then from 1947 to 1977, there's only been the Congress party in power. And then Congress begins to lose. So the great political scientists, you know, the late Rudolf, Suzanne and Lloyd Rudolf, wrote a piece which is called The Congress Learns to Lose. This is very different from saying the People's Action Party of Singapore has not learned to lose. 
the Communist Party of China has not learned to lose. So certainly solutions can be found in the PR system. But there, and, and I, I'm not saying that we should not have that debate, but what we are seeing today is basically a transformation of the DNA where uh, Nehru would praise Vajpayee for being a great emerging politician. Rajiv Gandhi would send Atal Bihari Vajpayee to New York on the pretext of representing India and in the United Nations when he could have his a surgery, a major surgery done. Narsimha Rao could trust uh, uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee to represent India in the United Nations. The nature of relationship between the ruling party and the opposition seems to have changed. It has become far more confrontational and that reflects on the part of the ruling dispensation a clear shift in trying to take the idea of India away from a certain equilibrium. Because as long as you are within that equilibrium, it really doesn't matter whether you are opposition or, uh, or your ruling party. But if that changes, yeah. then confrontation happens of a very different kind. And we are beginning to see those kinds of confrontations, which I think are not uh, very, very useful. Uh, of course, the PR system might, might work, but, but I think we are also seeing a change in the DNA, uh, which uh, also changes the nature of the DNA of the confrontation itself. Because you really don't think that secular is good. You really don't think that federal is good. You really don't think that mm -hmm. minorities need to be defined in the way in which they have to be. And that produces a very, very different kind of dynamics between the ruling party and the opposition. Thank you. Uh, we do have another question, but I would like uh, Christian Wagner to come in on this. But there's a question, another question specifically for you as well, Christian. So perhaps I could add that to this. And the question is, um, uh, which steps can a civilian take to minimize the impact of such authoritarian ways of any government all over the world? And of course, and especially in the case of India, um, where yes, the, the uh, coming back to some of the points so Rahul sort of mentioned, it's to interesting to note that this Prime Minister started so, you, um, with some reforms on the federal system in favor of what he called a cooperative fed federalism. So this crisis would have been an excellent opportunity to show what forms of cooperation in the federal structure uh, would have been possible for me. It's also a missed opportunity. When we talk about the lockdown, I think one should also keep in mind what would have been the alternative. And I think the alternative would have been something like a regional lockdown focused on certain states. Which would, because one should not forget Corona in the beginning was mostly uh, affected five to eight states. So there were only a, a, a handful of states which were seriously affected. Of course, when you bring it down to a state level, well, it brings up the question of capacities of the state in dealing with such a crisis, then you would have to bring in the uh, center. So you may have come up at similar kind of confrontations, hopefully maybe limited only to one or two states. Uh, so this would have been an alternative, let's say, because it would have prevented this disaster with the migrant workers. And I think we may only know uh, sometime in the future in how far the lockdown has really spread um, the virus um, to much bigger parts of India than before. Uh, what steps for the civilian? Well, it goes a little bit to what Rahul was mentioning. You have to point to the constitution. At, at the end of the day, I do not see any other forms. Um, you can engage yourself in political parties or in, um, in civil society organizations. Um, at the end, of course, the Indian constitution still is the main document and you have to go into all these kind of legal, uh, legal battles uh, which are necessary to upheld um, um, these uh, norms and uh, values. But as I would also think, similar to what Rahul said, I think we are, what we see in recent years, when I have lectures in Germany, I tell the audience very often, I think we have to say farewell to the idea of India that we have all grown up with, both personally and academically, because we are seeing something like 
in, in the European context, we would say it's a second republic. It changes the DNA, to use uh, Rahul terms, and it has a democratic uh, mandate. One should not forget about this. The BJP got some 37, 39% of the votes. Most uh, political parties in, in Western Europe would be happy to get a democratic mandate of in this of this height. So this is why I think one, it's extremely difficult um, because we I think we see some very f uh, fundamental changes, and the main battleground, of course, is the constitution. Is of course the watchdogs of the constitutions, be the ju uh, the judiciary, the press, or the states. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, Lars, would you like to come in? Because we have one time for just one final question, which also exists, uh, but which, which has come in that is on the media. Uh, but if you'd like to come in on this, then we can take that first. And then I will, uh, I will read out the question on media uh, and then uh, just have a final round from all three of you and end there. Uh, Lars, do you have anything to add to this? Or? Okay, all right. Then we'll move on to the final question from the audience. I mean, there's been a number, but uh, Adishi uh, has been kind enough to select a few uh, for us. Uh, what is your opinion on the media selectiveness in the local levels as well as national levels? Isn't this selectivity contributing towards political manipulation? I presume uh, uh, the I'm, I'm not, I presume um, the, the person who asked the question wants to know. Uh, it's a question on selectiveness uh, of reporting. Not Presumably. too much to yeah, that in, in general terms. Yeah. So, um, would you like to talk a little bit about this? Uh, and whether yes, the selectiveness, um, selectiveness of reporting is, always a problem uh, is actually contributing is towards uh, political so they manipulation? Of course, have their own features uh, themselves. Uh, um, who would like to come in but, on this? Um, All three of you can maybe make um, a final statement on this. Whether that's then a form of uh, manipulation um, Lars? Yes, in itself yes, um, is another question. I think manipulation. Um, it's a strong okay. word, and that of course mm -hmm. can be enforced, and can be enforced in many ways. And one more, one very important um, instrument is the selection. And my answer uh, uh, Rahul, would, would you like what to come in? This and um, what is happening to the media right now really reinforces uh, trends. So mm -hmm. you might remember that. Uh, Mr. Modi accused Dr. Manmohan Singh of being a Mon Pradhan Mantri. That means a, a, a Prime Minister who doesn't speak. But uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh often carried out press conferences. And in his own way, he would address uh, people from the free press without any limitations in an open setting. I have, it, I have this from uh, senior media persons that the only time that Mr. Modi has had a press conference was in 2014 and the next time he had a press conference was in 2019. And when he had a press conference in 2019, Mr. Amit Shah popped in. And after that 2019 press conference, he has had no press conference. He has met the press. A few hours before the lockdown, he met the captains of uh, not the Indian industry, but of press. And in a closed door session, he communicated brilliantly why the country must stand together behind the crisis. Do not dissent. This was his, and, and a lot of those people who were present in that meeting bought into that idea. So we are in a situation where Mr. Modi has only been talking to people in the privacy of his of his office, uh, under very guarded circumstances, without uh, being free and transparent in the manner of a classical press conference, and then he guides the media just before the COVID uh, episode. During the COVID episode, the Supreme Court basically. Uh, is directed, is, is, is basically asked, well, the, the government actually asked the media to be very disciplined. I mean, there's a, there's a government notice. The editor's guild of India actually says that this is not, uh, even those people within the media who are praising Mr. Modi signed on a document saying that this is not something that is on. 
and the Supreme Court actually came out with a notification which met Mr. Modi halfway. That, you know, please be responsible, but we will not censor. So this is the context. Now, in this context, we do find that the media was restricted, but I cannot say that the media was completely restricted because there are journalists who have gone and looked at migrant labor. There are people in the internet media who have actually been far more outspoken. But I would certainly think that it has been restricted. So, for example, most recently people say that uh, the death of the film actor Sushant Singh Rajput has taken up all the time of the television and people really don't have to worry about COVID. So I completely agree with the person who is asking. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Christian, uh, your last statement thank from you. you. We um, are well, well as I said, <laughs> beyond um, our time, the time the given. The pandemic yeah, right, seems to follow the logic of never miss, a, never miss a crisis. Um, so it will give uh, authoritarian governments and tendency a further up, upswing, unfortunately. Uh, one should also be clear, and I, I think Rahul mentioned the point, uh, authoritarian governments also benefit from the lack of an opposition. And this is also a phenomenon that we see in many South Asian countries, that it's not so much the strength of the authoritarian rulers, but it's also a weakness of opposition parties to have a common agenda, to agree on common leadership. Of course, a pandemic is certainly a difficult time to join forces uh, because the daily uh, problems are just too overwhelming and people have, have a lot of other problems rather than um, dealing uh, with those political issues. So in that sense, I would be not so positive on the pandemics as Lars is, but I think we are also discussing very dip, uh, different systems. Uh, so unfortunately, the pandemic has just strengthened the negative tendencies that we've seen in many parts of the subcontinent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all speakers. I think this has been an extremely stimulating discussion and we sort of provide the groundwork for a continuation of the series of web talks uh, tomorrow and uh, the day after. So thank you again. And I hand, it, hand uh, the microphone back to Adishri, if there's off, anything sorry. you want to say. Yeah, I, Adishri, I want to thank everyone as well. Very interesting discussion, um, uh, personally as well. And uh, I can also say from the audience interaction um, that we're very glad to have all of you on the panel um, and that you address the topics from all sorts of uh, directions here, which was necessary for this conversation. Um, so thank you.